economics is not frequently thought of as a tool of natural resources management. But the work of George Warren has shown us how powerful a tool it can be. This morning, we've asked Dr. Edward Dobb, a colleague of his from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, to come up and lead the charge in the testimonial for Dr. Warren. Thank you, sir. Now, before I begin our joint presentation, I was asked as the Wehrmine clan gathered out there to perhaps at least break the ice by asking all the Wehrmine heritage people to rise before I begin. Would you please rise? Oh, yes. I will begin our presentation with discovering George Werwein, and then I will turn it over to Ronnie Barlow uh, for his contribution and to Austin Werwein for his, and I'll have a final memorial tribute at the close. I will give introductory remarks for both of our speakers when I complete this presentation, and uh, that will facilitate an exchange of people coming up and uh, discovering George Werwin. I feel most grateful that Providence ordained me to research the career of George Werwin to nominate him in 1998 for membership in the Conservation Hall of Fame, and to participate today in this ceremony that welcomes him into the fold, the first to be heralded for long-standing work in land use. I use the word providence because before 1997, I had not even known his name. It all came about because of digging around in the University of Wisconsin archives in search of information about a very ambitious multidisciplinary program born in the 1930s. <coughs> it was known as Science Inquiry, a major effort to realize the Wisconsin idea of serving the people in the state. President E.B. Fred, in his contribution to the oral history of the university, hailed Science Inquiry as the most important event during his years as the Dean of the Graduate School. Science Inquiry was indeed an ambitious program because it sought to coalesce contributions from an amazing range of disciplines as evidenced by the vision expressed in the first Science Inquiry Bulletin published in 1935 entitled The University and the Erosion Problem. A lively interest in erosion control was found, quote, a lively interest in erosion control was found throughout the institution. There is a growing realization that the chemist, the physicist, the botanist, the bacteriologist, the geologist, the geographer, the soil specialist, the engineer, the animal husbandman, the agronomist, the agriculturalist, the forester, the economist, and the lawyer, hope no academics here feel left out, <laughs> um, must band together and that the contribution of each will be infinitely more effective if it is amalgamated with the others into a single coordinated program. Each inquiry into the problem was expected to summarize the curriculum offerings related to the problem in all colleges and their departments, assess the research projects already underway in the university, which were relevant to the problem, suggest new directions for research into the issue, and identify a multidisciplinary curricula for both undergraduate and graduate study. The subcommittee that marshaled the erosion study bore one name that claimed my complete attention, Aldo Leo. I ignored the rest. However, in seeking further information about Leopold and science inquiry, I came upon this comment by Leopold's biographer, Kurt Meine, in his work, Otto Leopold, His Life and Work. Regarding Leopold's acclaimed essay, 
on conservation economics. Quote, between the lines, one reads the influence of George Werwin, a colleague in the university's Department of Agricultural Economics, whose original work on the economics of land reform, soil erosion, and rural taxation would have a steady impact on Leopold. And it turned out, upon further digging into the archives, that Werwin probably was the major figure at the University of Wisconsin in science inquiry, for he served on four of the six subcommittees that prepared science inquiry bulletins. So, as Sherlock Holmes said to Watson, the chase was on. Well, fortunately, others had already been engaged in seeking information about George Werewine. The key person was Gerald Vaughan, who has worked for over 40 years in natural resource economics and policy analysis in federal, state, and university positions. Well, in his search, Jerry had asked Mel Cody to reminisce about the relation between Werewine and Leopold as he experienced it. And here are some of Mel Cohey's reminiscences from when he served as Werewine's graduate assistant at the university. At the time, Leopold had just been appointed as professor of game management and assigned to the Department of Agricultural Economics. Mel Cohey said, frequently Werewine would come into his office where I was sitting and take half to one hour and a half, telling me about discussing the contents of an in-staff meeting in which he had just participated. Always so, it seemed he'd been most impressed with Leopold's contributions. And oftentimes, he and Leopold had continued discussions after the meetings had adjourned. Werewine was gaining from Leopold revelations about ecosystems, relations of wildlife, wildlife and land use, broad land use patterns beneficial to beauty with their non-monetary measurable values, and needs for man's appreciation of natural resources. Werwein would try to fit these considerations into his land economics within its practicality, or if necessary to expand his earlier rationale. Leopold was gaining basic land economic principles from Werwein and how to apply them within his framework of natural resources and conservation principles. Then, Mel he reflected on his experience with Leopold at the Coon Creek Watershed Erosion Control Demonstration Project. And he mentioned that in the evenings, Leopold held so-called rump sessions with the young conservationists at work on the project. And he said, oftentimes, when Leopold would bring some economics into discussions of his ecological and conservation ideas, that is, philosophies, he would pseudo quote Professor Werewolf and by name. No doubt about it, Leopold greatly admired George S. Werewolf. Now, I'll briefly introduce our next presenters Raleigh Barlow, the last doctoral student of George Werewolf, Professor Emeritus at Michigan State University. In his first major work, Land Resource Economics, The Political Economy of Rural and Urban Land Resource Use, published in 1958, Raleigh Barlow dedicated his book as follows, to the memory of George S. Werwein, gifted teacher, scholar, and public servant, sincere and humble friend of man and land. And following Raleigh's presentation of the legacy of George Werwein will have another live treasure. The firstborn child to George and Anna Ruby Werwein, their son Austin, in the words of his citation as distinguished journalist by the Regents at UW in 1963, quote, winner of the Pulitzer Prize of 1953 for international reporting in the Milwaukee Journal, Brilliant craftsman for Time Magazine, the Chicago Sun Times, and currently the New York Times. Of course, after that, uh, he went into many other distinguished careers for his perceptive practice of the reporter's art. 
and Austin's presentation will be George S. Werwein, Conservation Prophet. Bali, please. Thank you, Ed. It's good to be here today. Notice I've brought my remarks with me. Up until the time of my retirement some 20 years ago, I used to lecture without notes. But today I'm going to tie myself down to a manuscript for two reasons. One is some assurance to you that it'll take me somewhat less than my usual 50 minutes. <laughs> Second, it's going to be a Clutch, or a crutch to me in case I suddenly forget everything I know. Many years ago, my father told me that as you get older, three things are going to happen to you. First, you're going to start forgetting things. And he was sure right on that. Matter of fact, I can't remember what the other two things were. <laughs> Aldo Leopold, whom I had the good fortune to know and work with, was one of the first to be inducted to the Wisconsin Conservation Hall of Fame. Today he is being joined in this honor by his good friend and colleague, George S. Warwhite. The two men worked together. They were good friends. Uh, each influenced the other. Both were giants in their fields. Uh, Warwhite was to the economics of land use and resource conservation what uh, Leopold was to ecology. As a land economist, Werwein was a sincere, or had a sincere appreciation of the value of natural resources, uh, of our need to preserve our resource base for future generations, and the need for institutional arrangements that favored its wise use. He insisted that his fellow economists give particular regard to the operation of the human institutions, such as law and property rights, as well as economic factors, and they, and I quote, have some understanding of biotic ecological relationships and the impact of man on his environment. It was 1939 when I first heard of George Warwick. At the time, I was taking some graduate courses that stirred my imagination in becoming a land economist. I discussed the prospect of doing this with four economists in the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And every one of them gave me the same advice. Go to Wisconsin and study with George, George Werwein. Of course, the fact that all four of them had their doctorate degrees from Wisconsin had nothing to do with their advice. <laughs> It was a year later that I registered at Madison, and I'll never forget the day when I was ushered into his office to meet the great man. I hardly knew what to expect. I was, uh, I saw a tall, lean man who greeted me with a reassuring smile and quickly uh, uh, put me at uh, ease with a cordial, his cordial manner and the indication of interest in my welfare. During the weeks that followed, my admiration and respect to Professor Worldwide steadily increased. He was a good teacher with a practical, wholesome outlook. His lectures were packed with variable information, pertinent observation, and an understanding of the real world. As I recall my impressions of him, terms such as congenial, down-to-earth, gracious, humble, modest, realistic, straight shooting, came to mind. There was much in his background he could have, been, uh, could have bragged about, but he never did. He was ever inch a uh, Christian gentleman who exhibited genuine skill, understanding, patience in estimating or in extending knowledge to others. And among his peers, he stood out like a a majestic white pine in the Wisconsin forest. Werwein was a native of Wisconsin who dearly loved the state. He held to the stewardship of the land philosophy that called for treaty, or called for every generation, making uh, uh, or seeing resources as something that should be left in 
good shape for the next generation. Uh, he appreciated the need for developing land for agriculture and urban uses. And at the same time, he saw strong uh, arguments for multiple use. He was almost a generation ahead of his time in his insistence that sites be saved for agricultural and urban, or sites be saved in agriculture and urban areas for parks, open space, and public recreation use. My work with him centered on the problems of the northern counties. Uh, with them, he was painfully aware of the sad effects slashing the great prairies, the great uh, pineries that had, in leaving much of the region, a cut over wasteland. He argued for programs that would help Mother Nature get forests back into use to provide a livelihood for the local people and at the same time provide uh, flood control, uh, climate modification, provide habitat for wildlife, sites for future summer homes, and opportunities for recreational developments. It's sometimes hard for us today to remember what the situation was like back in the 1930s. Most of the state's one-time great forests had been cut over. The dream that the forests would give way to productive farms uh, had not worked out. Uh, few landowners uh, saw an opportunity to hold their forests for uh, economic reasons. They found it profitable to just uh, drop them, uh, quit paying their taxes. The Great Depression hit the state, and uh, four million acres in Wisconsin were soon uh, tax delinquent. Michigan and uh, Minnesota had another uh, 10 million acres, and in Michigan we published a bulletin entitled The Land Nobody Wanted. The land nobody wanted 70 years ago is now the land that everybody wants. <laughs> Uh, our demand for recreational hunting, forestry, rural recreational sites uh, makes us forget that this was once uh, land that is considered almost worthless. In one of my jobs working with Outdoor Worldwide, I had to uh, check county tax rolls. And I recall seeing hundreds of entries of 40s that were on the tax rolls at a price of $100. That's $2 and a half an acre. And there were lots of them on the tax roll that only half that amount. As Werwein saw it, northern Michigan had two major problems. Uh, pro programs were needed to get the cutover back into production, a process that was going to take years before anyone could count on making any profits. Programs were needed to cut local government costs, to tie the local towns and counties over financially. With the first of these problems, he wanted the state and the U.S. Forest Service to add to the size of their holdings. He saw the state funding as an appropriate means for encouraging the designation and the rejuvenation of county forests. And he advocated uh, reforming our method of taxation to give forest owners the option of paying taxes on at a nominal rate of growing forests until they were ready for harvest. Holding down governmental costs was the second challenge. With the loss of jobs in cities such as Milwaukee and Chicago, a lot of people had moved back onto the land. They saw opportunities to get local governments to provide them with welfare payments and provide needed services. There was even one case of an individual who moved back, located seven miles off of a highway, asked the town to reactivate the road, found the when time came to send his kids to school, he uh, found a schoolhouse three miles from where his house was. His wife got the job teaching the kids and he got the bus, contract for driving the bus. <laughs> Cases like this uh, provided the impetus for much of the adoption of rural zoning ordinances. By, uh, uh, these offices uh, provided for uh, or prohibited year-round residents of areas not suited for agricultural recreational use, and 
town officials soon found that by adopting these ordinances that they were promoting good land use. Now, as men like Walter Rollins and L.G. Sorden were largely responsible for the adoption of the ordinances, <coughs> and behind them stood George Warwine as providing intellectual leadership for the idea that zoning could provide the needed step to help it to provide for good, uh, solid land use. The cases I have mentioned represent only a fraction of Warwine's contribution to the case of the cause of wise land use. He authored a widely known textbook, Land Economics. He was elected president of the National Farm Economics Association. In addition to his teaching and research work, he was frequently called upon to advise federal and state officials and others on a wide gamut of rural and urban land use problems, uh, land tenure problems, location problems, resource conservation, uh, zoning, local government uh, policies, and the federal government sub marginal land purchase and settler relocation programs. Speaking for myself, I congratulate you for extending this honor to Professor Warwine. He was my academic master. I'll be forever in his debt for stirring my interest in land economics and giving direction to my career. I had the pleasure of working with him during the last year of his life. During his last summer, my wife and I spent two wonderful weeks working with him, traveling, working, eating, living with him throughout most of the northern counties in Wisconsin. We came away from that experience with a cherished memory of loving and respecting him very much as though we were a member of our own family. Among the most important things that he taught me in the years I worked with him was the importance of having a holistic view of one's endeavors and recognizing the success or the success we enjoy in working with the Earth's resources calls for recognition of his threefold framework. If any policy or policy or program to be successful has to start out being uh, physically and biologically possible. It needs to be feasible from an economic and technological and technological sense. It needs to be institutionally acceptable. Now, before I leave in here, I'd like to uh, ask uh, Professor Philip Rock to stand with the will. He's here from the University of Minnesota. And Phil and I, when well, we were roommates at the University of Wisconsin, he's a year ahead of me, and he too worked with Dr. Merwin. He has comments, I invite him to say it. Thank Economics at the University of Minnesota, and uh, one of my claims to fame is I was tolerated as a roommate by Raleigh Barlow. <laughs> we crossed those paths together in 1940. My brief comments relate to several things that have already been mentioned. One was George Werwein's interest in the cutover lands, another was his interest in good public policy with respect to tax reversion of tax delinquent land. And his goal was to put land into use. Uh, in his teaching, land economics was a life science. It was not a part of mortuary science. <laughs> and the skills you needed to be an effective land economist were those of a onlooking, ongoing, proponent of wise use of resources, not of embalming. And I can hear him now, can visualize his reactions to some of the recent trends in the conservation movement, in that he was most interested in seeing that these resources were put to good use, not necessarily that they were preserved in aspic. 
and this was especially true in his northern Wisconsin studies. I liked Raleigh Barlow. I was hired uh, several years ahead of him to make an inventory of the county-owned land in northern Wisconsin in 3940. And you could have bought the southern half of Douglas County, mine owned west to the Wisconsin-Minnesota border, for 50 cents an acre. And one of my failures as an economist. <laughs> <laughs> I did. Uh, his, his legacy is widespread. And not only the people that were his major students, but those who took his classes and those that listened to his public speech. Uh, we had uh, ample evidence of that during the war. I was in the Navy. Uh, we ran across people who knew we were from Wisconsin, and it was quite frequently the case that they had known of Wisconsin through George Werwein's work. He was deeply influential in the U.S. Department of Agriculture in this indirect fashion, in that people who were trained with him became department chiefs or the essential individuals in segments of the department that had to do with uh, land use, uh, land planning, uh, public land management, uh, and a whole string of related resources. Uh, I had a thesis proposed with him as my advisor in 1940-41 and it was sunk at Pearl Harbor, along with the Navy. Uh, and I, at the end of the war, I was back in a position where I thought I could see a possibility of resuming my thesis plans, and I wrote a letter to him, uh, probably in the, in the fall of 1946, and got a reply back saying, I'm regretfully obligated to tell you that he died just a few weeks ago. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was my final contact, contact with him. But his legacy has been permanent. And I've been very grateful throughout my life for the career launch that he made possible. Thank you. Acts to follow. Maybe I could uh, digress just a moment. Uh, something I saw in the paper about my old friend <coughs> Gaylord Nelson, who uh, was inducted into the Hall of Fame back in 1886. He was being honored down in Madison. I think they're naming him, naming for him one of the uh, conservation departments at the university. At any rate, uh, Senator and former Governor Nelson recalled that when he was uh, in Madison as governor, he got a very, very critical letter from somebody in Janesville. And uh, he, Nelson, wrote a scathing letter back uh, saying that anybody could say those things is dire need of a psychiatrist. Much to his surprise, he got a letter back from his pen and Jay's a rather cordial letter that ended, and thank you very much for replying. Perhaps you could recommend to me the shrink that you are using. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm not sure what the moral of that is, except I suppose we should all be crazy, as uh, Nelson has been for conservation. Uh, I want to say a few things today about a, being the son of George Werlein. Uh, he died 57 years ago, and he's entering the Hall of Fame at long, long last, uh, thanks to Professor Dahl, who did yeoman's service uh, in reviving his legacy. So I am here representing the Werlein family, and I'm 
very, very touched that so many of my cousins showed up. Uh, representing them as well as myself, my sons, all the people in my hair. Uh, to, uh, and I want to uh, say that the Hall of Fame is recognizing my father as a pioneer, pioneer conservationist, but he was more than that. Uh, he was, in a certain biblical sense, a prophet. And broadly stated, his message was that the purpose of conservation is to benefit posterity. Is there a better one? His academic soulmate, Leopold, was a vigorous naturalist and outdoorsman. And uh, he wrote in his Sand Hill Almanac that the best definition of a conservationist is written not with a pen, but with an axe. But Leopold added the caveat that signatures do, of course, vary, and uh, that uh, indeed uh, conservation, the conservationist can be written uh, not only with a with an axe but a pen. I don't know whether Leopold had my father in mind when he wrote those very words, but he was right on the mark. My father was definitely a pen rather than an axe conservationist. He did not fish, neither did he hunt, or camp, or sail, or watch birds, or chase butterflies in the wildflowers. He didn't garden or even mow the lawn, which after all was my duty. <laughs> <laughs> he did take long walks, which was fortunate because he never learned how to drive a car. He wasn't some very definition of a bookman, the old definition which means somebody who is learned and studious. Not an outdoorsman with an axe. And yet nobody in Wisconsin could have been more down to earth in a most liberal sense. He was born and raised on a poor 79 acre Manitowoc County farm. And a farm that had been settled by his German immigrant grandfather only 19 years before his birth. In this Ech Deutsch environment, he absorbed the land ethic described as Sonia Salomon of the Max Decatie Institute at the University of Wisconsin. She said that Wisconsin German settlers held their land in sacred trust for their, for their families rather than what the English speaking settlers did, which was to treat land as a commodity for speculation. Although he was not cut out to be a dirt farmer, my father had a spiritual feeling for the family homestead to which he returned many times and which stayed in wearing hands for 98 years. From uh, this beginning grew a value system that shaped both academic land theory and, and uh, uh, land law. As a uh, leading professor of land economics in his time, he was, he was respected as much for his heart as for his head. As uh, Philip Rupp, one of his graduate students who is here today, wrote to me at, uh, several years ago uh, these words. His effectiveness owed much to his personal qualities. He was a kindly man and a gifted and patient teacher who inspired confidence and loyalty in his students. There was about him a touch of the 19th century image of a German farmer, of a German father professor, but completely free of any autocratic tinge. 
He was long-sighted. It enriched his teaching and counseling with historical references, reflecting his wide knowledge of literature outside his chosen field. Now let me tell you just a little bit about his wide knowledge. It embraced many things about economics, of course, but all manner of things of other things. He was one of those avid Gilbert and Sullivan fans, and he collected the programs from all the plays of any kind that he had seen since 1903. He had piles of clippings and reference materials and kept stacks of scrapbooks on subjects ranging from the Lafayette Progressive Movement to art and architecture. Naturally, he had a special interest in Frank Lloyd Wright, who was still strutting around Madison and Spring Green in person in those days. <laughs> Although he never navigated anything bigger than a leaky wooden water rowboat, he loved everything about the sea and ships as only an armchair sailor can. And he made, made for me a large boat book that inspired my own slightly more active interest in boats. And of course, he was an erudite collector of books. Many in his large library were old and rare. I think he was, in some ways, a historian at heart. Certainly, history informed his economics. One of the most revealing aspects of his intellect and personality was his love for the extensive, extensive research he made into biblical history. Although he was born into the Lutheran Church in Manitowoc and became a Congregationalist in Madison, his non-sectarian research was concerned with the economics, uh, the economic background of the Bible, particularly the Old Testament. He uh, shared his popular Bible lectures with a radio audience in a number of Bible, adult Bible study groups uh, in Madison, and at one time with students at a religious seminary in Evanston, Illinois. He was not a preacher. He was more of a theologian. And theologians are, after all, historians under the skin. Gerald Vaughan uh, raised a glorious banner in his 1999 article on the uh, religious roots of uh, Werwein's views of property rights and, uh, and uh, land use uh, and conservation. Uh, Vaughan's title for his article about uh, my father's work was nothing less than the sovereignty of God. My father would have found that uh, that title a, a little bit too glorious, but one got it right. In more earthly, the earthly language, my father was talking about God as the ultimate landlord and all that entails. My father's thesis was that the Old Testament and its prophets grew out of the soil. He said, "Strong, simple men." coming from farms in the wilderness, became fearless prophets who defied kings and priests to proclaim Jehovah as the one God of all nations. He said that Levit Leviticus 25 recognizes private property and land, but also imposes limits. Biblical property rights were not absolute. In fact, my father wrote, it is proclaimed that Jehovah is the ultimate owner of all land, and men hold positions as tenants at his pleasure. And according to the Bible, he says, The land shall not be sold forever, for the land is mine, for ye are strangers and sojourners with me, saith the Lord. Turning to the Lord's Prayer, in the New Testament, my father took the words, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, 
to mean uh, that our neighborhood should be clean and wholesome wards in the city of God. As some modern churchmen have put it, conservation is caring for creation. One of the reasons Werwein and Leopold worked so well together is that they shared this Bible-based feeling for land ethics. Half a century ago, my father was among the first economists to find common ground with conservationists who, like Leopold, were clearing the way for the modern universal ecological movement. They were not only present at the creation, they were creators. Sixty-one years ago, my father said so, that the land economists must not only consider human institutions, but also have some understanding of ecological relationships and the human impact on the environment. Few in Texas, or even Alaska, would dissent from that rubric today. But in 1941, Bible based or not, it was a new concept. Then, most landowners claimed a God-given right to do as they pleased on and to their plot. They didn't cite God. They relied on Adam Smith the father of the theory that self-interest in the long run uh, creates public good. But back then, George Werwein, speaking of Adam Smith's fellow economist, argued that the classical self-interest philosophy, today we call it the free market, must yield to conservational utilization of natural resources. The marketplace may indeed be magic, but there's more magic in nature's places. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>
about the use of natural resources. And whereas George was the leading teacher of land economics in the 20s, 30s, and 40s, and whereas his work with state and local officials led to the recovery of thousands of acres of denuded, tactile land in northern Wisconsin, and whereas his work with state and local officials led to the establishment of county zoning, the first real example of rural land use zoning in the nation, and whereas George's pioneering article, The Rural Urban Fringe, published in the journal Economic Geography, is credited with providing the theoretical framework for researchers worldwide who continue to address the conflict between rural land uses and urban, urban expansion. Now, therefore, the members of the Wisconsin Legislature, on the motion of Senator Shabilsky and Representative Marianne Lippert and Representative Lassa, commend George Werewine for his accomplishments and for being inducted posthumously into the Wisconsin Conservation Hall of Fame. Congratulations. Taking the lead in securing this, or proposing and saying the process through to get Professor Worldwide recognized. Hey, thank you. <laughs>